our sermon message today, Bold for Christ. Bold for Christ, our key scripture, Isaiah 40, verse 29. And friends, the Bible recounts some interesting conversations when it comes to Jesus and other people. I'm sure you could agree. And sometimes the stories leave us scratching our heads in confusion, and other times they leave us sort of in awe of his wisdom, right? We read it and we say, wow, that's, that's quite something. And so <clears throat> the story of his discussion with the Samaritan woman at the well is probably a little bit of both. And I want to say, uh, stay with me this morning as we unpack, unpack how this interaction with Jesus reflects a certain type of boldness in the faith. Because we need to be bold nowadays. So this is uh, a depiction and piece of art that I found that I really like uh, to, to kind of display the, the top of the well. Because for some reason I can picture them just kind of chatting and sitting like this. In John 4, 19 to 23 says, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, but the Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. Very interesting passage, a lot to unpack here. Um, it's always very interesting to me. Not everyone can get away with telling someone, hey bud, you worship who you do not know. Okay? Salvation's from the Jews. Sorry, right? But Jesus, I'm sure, said it in a way with truth and spirit that spoke to her heart. And with this statement, Jesus, by the way, effectively releases the Samaritan woman from the idea that you can only pray in certain areas and at certain times and with certain people, right? And, and we kind of see the converse of this sometimes in churches today. Uh, we say, okay, it's time to pray over the dinner or it's time to pray, uh, where's the pastor, right? And so this is, this is kind of like Jesus saying, no, you, you have the ability now. You have that power to pray when you need to. And this isn't controversial today, but it was back then. It was in that time. Because preaching and teaching was to be done in the synagogue with who? The Pharisees or the Sadducees, right? And 2,000 years ago, that was the way it was done. And, and Jesus was considered a rebel because this guy's walking around preaching from hilltops, and he's going into synagogues, and he's saying, you know, uh, here's what God actually thinks. And people marveled at his wisdom after a few moments of listening to him, especially because he didn't hang out very often with the religious elite, with the elect, right? They didn't like each other. And he did his own thing, his own way, which just so happened to also be God's way. And so this changes the mindset of the devout Christian. It opens up the opportunity for prayer because Jesus made atonement for our sin. So now we can approach the throne. We can pray to the Father at any time and at any place if we are covered under the blood. And you can pray in the car on the way to work like I've done many times at home before dinner, in a hospital room, before sporting events, right? First thing in the morning, right before bed at night. And this revelation uh, no doubt expanded the minds of people 2,000 years ago, especially this young lady at the well, because the effects of the spiritual freedom are still being enjoyed today, at least in our country, at least for now. And so the last part of the scripture I want to focus on here for just a minute and it says, uh, the Father seeks a certain type of worshiper, the type who gives back to God in both spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. What does that mean? We're going to spend some time unpacking it right now and talk about how that leads to being bold for Christ. Um, because there's a combination uh, of passion, which is can, you know, can be construed as spirit, with an accurate view of who the Lord really is, and that's the truth. That's truth. And so if both of these things don't exist together, then we fall short, I think, when it comes to praising God the Father, because we're only getting it half right, half right, one way or the other. So in order to understand our right relation to God and the Holy Trinity, uh, we must first understand how the Bible depicts this concept of spirit and truth. If we don't, then we're in a similar position to the Samaritan woman at the well, and we're kind of scratching our heads trying to figure out uh, what God and Jesus are telling us with this spirit and truth thing. 
Um, she didn't have a true picture of who God really was, and Jesus corrected her with gentleness and love. And so let's take a moment now to unpack uh, what this kind of uh, lukewarm or misdirected worship might look like if and when people don't really know who the God of the Bible is. And so if you have, for example, spirit but no truth, in other words, there's emotionalism that you're connecting with, but only emotionalism, then at the end of the day, you can walk away empty. And emotionalism is actually one of the new religions of the day, I think, today. It's very fast rising. Um, and that is, I'm going to feel my way through life only. Uh, it's a gut reaction. I'm offended that you're offended, right? And this emotional charge takes, takes, uh, takes over. Uh, not only the news media, but out in the world today, we hear something, and if we don't like it, uh, we get really angry, and if we like it, we say, here, here, but sometimes it doesn't go any farther than that. And so if this is the type of experience that a church has, and, and it's only uh, the emotional stuff, then, then worship can eventually feel kind of hollow, um, and, and the faithful can kind of fall away at the first sign of trouble, uh, because it's really exciting at first, but it's not built to last on its own. There may be music, dancing, hallelujahs, but that stuff fades when you hit the parking lot and you leave the church grounds, right? Uh, they aren't preaching solid food, so you'll be hungry again in an hour. By contrast, if you have truth, but no spirit, right? So if you know, uh, if you know this thing forwards and backwards, if you know the truth, but you don't have any spirit that is attached to it, it can lead to legalism, which is what the Pharisees were big on, okay? So legalism, the rules, and only the rules. And so there is head knowledge, but there's no real passionate connection to Jesus himself. It's the other half uh, without uh, the first part. And this type of faith definitely lends itself, I think, um, to being really, really cool at first, because you can be impressed with knowledge, but over time, it's not so great, uh, because the accumulation of knowledge and facts can be overemphasized, uh, aside from the personal relationship with Jesus. And if you're, if you're one of those uh, legalist people, you'll be almost intolerable to talk to, right? After the first five or ten minutes, people just get out of there. Um, so we remember the know-it-all from high school, right? There was always at least one or two kids that were the know-it-all. And if you can't remember who it was, it was you, right? Um, so anyway, that's, that's the thing. That's the mindset. I know the answers, and I know this, and I know that. <clears throat> and, and good for you, but you can't start hardly stand to be around them. So... <clears throat> You may get praised by the teacher for how much you know, right? So the, the Pharisees would love you. The Sadducees would say, boy, this is our type of person. But you would never feel quite good enough to earn God's, earn God's approval in a personal way because you don't have the other component, that passion and that spirit. I hope that makes sense, spirit and truth. Uh, so I want to spend just a moment talking about a famous Christian apologist named Ravi Zach Zacharias. If you know who Ravi Zacharias is, he was a big big time speaker, he would travel the world, he'd go to colleges, and he'd just give these amazing uh, diatribes, these amazing talks, um, and, and it was good, I listened to him and I liked him, but then these rumors started to come out that in his personal life he wasn't acting in accordance to the stuff he was preaching. Um, and some, I won't go into too much detail, but some, some stories started to come out, especially after his death, uh, that ended up being true, and so people were scratching their heads saying, what is going on here? This, this great Christian man who is traveling the world and defending the faith was doing a 180 over here in his personal life. And, and those uh, things haunted him and, and followed him. And so that, that, I think, is an example of someone who had great head knowledge, right? They had the truth, but not necessarily connected to Christ, uh, to Jesus. And so I once, uh, once heard a preacher's story about this large congregation. And on any given Sunday, they'd pack in a few thousand worshipers. And it was a huge arena, had a small restaurant, a coffee bar, uh, just outside the sanctuary because Jesus needed coffee, right? In a restaurant back in the garden. No, he didn't. Uh, so there was a bookstore on the upper deck, and they would pray from time to time, and then the pastor would deliver a sermon, but when it came time to sing, this, this preacher said, you know, God couldn't hear them. He couldn't hear what they were singing. People's mouths were moving, but it was as if nothing was coming out. Something was missing at these church services. There was no connection to the real living God. And some of the people had spirit, but no truth. Others had a sprinkle of the truth, but without any spirit or emotion attached. 
They were joyless voices in a tired congregation. And so there was no boldness, no desire to understand the full picture of who God really was or to bring that picture to the rest of the world. They were just going through the motions. And so this is not the experience that God desires for you and I, friends. It really isn't. God wants us to actually connect with him, to be bold in the faith through spirit and truth and in the confidence that we carry his message accurately. And the best way to do that is to both study his word so we can understand who the real God is, right? Because if we're not uh, reading this on a regular basis, what happens? We start to build an idea of God that looks and sounds and talks just like we do, believes the same politics that we do, believes the same, you know, and so on and so forth. But we've got to stay in that book. And then to bring our whole being and our whole emotion to the forefront when we praise him because God doesn't want these cardboard cutout automatons, right? That are singing, but you can't hear their voices. He wants us to bring passion to the knowledge and the understanding of who he really is. And if it moves you to tears, all the better. And there are churches in China, and I mentioned this before, um, that, that meet underground. There's all these underground churches still to this day. And they literally meet in basements and in back alleys and private houses because the government doesn't sanction this stuff. They do uh, at the public level, but not actually, not in reality. And so Christians are often persecuted for their faith over there, so they hide away in a church where it's safe or, or a basement, and no air conditioning, no pews, no large building, no coffee shop, no restaurant, no bookstore. And if you're lucky, there are folding chairs, but much of the time it's standing room only. And these services go on for hours and hours. And you can bet when they're singing, hymn after hymn after hymn, there is something coming out of their mouth. God can hear them. No one checks their watches if the sermon runs long. There are no disputes about gossip, no talk about politics, just a room full of believers worshiping boldly in spirit and truth, and often only a few moments away from the prospect of being caught at any given time with that knock on the door. Imagine the faith being cultivated in a climate like this. And so I want to point uh, to a piece of scripture from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is an old book in the Bible. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This should sound familiar to us, right? And so God is looking for fully engaged believers like this with our whole soul, loving with all our strength. And we know because he told us so, worshipers who come to God with the boldness of faith that's required in today's world. And my fear is that this type of worship might become more and more uncommon uh, in the West as time goes by. And we're often run amok by, you know, political correctness or cancel culture or wokeness or whatever it's called now, uh, or the spirit of fear or the spirit of confusion. And granted, we're not the only country suffering from this plight, but I have a feeling that in many churches and in lots of different places, people are singing, but there is no sound coming out. God doesn't hear them. And so we're also familiar with this piece of scripture from Revelation. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Forsaken that love of Christ, that love of Jesus, that boldness in the faith. And churches must strive to be keepers of the faith, to pass along something worth transmitting from one generation to the next, to keep God as our first love. And even our key scripture from Isaiah today that I mentioned earlier, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And it can seem like an insurmountable task some days. Trust me, I understand to make an attempt at living godly lives, right? Some days it's the, the type of day where you're lucky to get out of bed, okay? And, and you make it through the day and you just slug along and even coffee doesn't help, right? And it seems like a, just an insurmountable task. And so even when the deck is stacked against us and we are weary, God says, I will build you up. He says, I know, I get it. I understand the world you live in. I see what's going on. I will build you up. And friends, this generation, I don't, I, it might be the most difficult one to stay virtuous and holy. It might be the most difficult one yet. Uh, our cell phones, for example, take us right into a world of internet sin, if we so desire it. It's right at our fingertips. It doesn't take long to, to look outside uh, our communities and other cities and places 
uh, to find, you know, theology and, and things that don't line up with this. And many, many people are following that stuff today. And that was prophecy in the book of Revelation. They said false Christs and false preaching are coming um, and people will follow. Uh, and so we can feel weary and just plain tired from fighting uh, the good fight sometimes. But with Jesus, he'll build us up. We can stand boldly for God and what he represents, his spirit and his truth. Because we draw from Jesus' power, not just our own, right? And without Jesus, we are vulnerable to slipping back into culturally minded worship which espouses, you know, whatever values the secular world might be esteeming or, or pushing at the time. And, and may we continue to fight against uh, the singing with nothing coming out of the mouth, right? Instead, bring our whole being to the cross every Sunday in spirit and truth. And so even better if we live like this Monday through Saturday as well. Be bold for Jesus, especially in these end times. Let's pray together. Lord, give us the courage to be effective Christians today. Let us meet people where they are at, not where we're at necessarily. Let us be gentle, let us listen, and then encourage lively worship in both spirit and truth. And we pray this in Jesus' awesome and inspiring name.